I'm going to so Veronica, where are you located? I'm an hour southwest of Chicago in Shanahan, very close to Juliet, the, from okay. the Blues Brothers movies. I know where that is. Yep, the Juliet prison and all of the um, Blues Brothers um, cultural history. It's really a neat Ooh. area here. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of uh, fun. I've been through there, and uh, right now I'm in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm an hour I, or a hundred miles south of Denver. Um, but I'm claiming refugee status here because I'm a uh, escapee from California. So, I swam the river to get out of there, and and so I ended up here. So there you go. <laughs> oh, I hope you like it better. Do you like it better in Pueblo? You know, it. it, it yeah, I do. I mean, I miss the ocean because I mean, my house was a block away from from the beach. Oh, I'd never want to escape from the ocean. So I yeah. really, really um, miss that part. Um, I, I miss the cost of living out there and in, in, in not be uh, in, in a different way because it's uh, so sky high. Yeah. And uh, here everything's affordable and uh, um, I'm, I'm really close to everything that, that I'm involved in, so I don't have to travel far or anything like that to, to do what I need to do, so it's pretty fun. I'm glad you found a spot that you love. Oh, yeah, I know. He loves it, and he said everything's nearby, his house and everything. <laughs> Wait, so what was... I I cannot thank you enough, Jill, for all that you do for this group. I, it's just so wonderful. Oh, thank yeah. You. I know it's just I know it's a labor of love, but it's still a labor, it and, it's, a and labor. it's nonstop. I mean, you just have stuff going on all the time, and both all of you guys. I'm most in touch with Jill, but I mean, thank you all for everything that you do. They're awesome. They're definitely behind the scenes kind of people, like my support system i keep telling everybody that i was the in high school going up through school i was always the nerd that ran the projector you know in in, in school well guess what i'm still that guy <laughs> the av guy the av nerd yeah so i'm I, i'm the av nerd but i do all jill's artwork and and uh uh i'm a graphic artist and recording engineer and just uh, uh, all around. Uh, I, I, I spent over 40 years in professional theater. So doing doing lighting, wow. and sound, doing lighting and sound and video and anything technical. So, uh, and uh, when I lived back in California, they, uh, a lot of the theaters would call me in because I specialized in motion control and special effects and hydraulics and stuff like that. So a lot of the theaters there when they were doing a show that needed something complicated, um, they'd call me in and and I'd make all the complicated happen. So uh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, that's a good feeling when you can help like that with a special knowledge. Yeah, and right now I'm the uh, rink DJ and technical director down at our uh, local ice arena. It's a city owned building, but they let me do whatever I want in there as long as I let them know what I'm up to. So I installed my own sound system and I am having fun because I get to do anything and everything in there that I, I want to want to do. So. Oh, how fun. Yeah, it's great. Oh, wow. Look, you have a nice little setup there. Yeah, I was can you see it? Kind of dark, isn't it? No, it's lighting no. up. Good. Yeah, oh, you know what? I'm going to put you on spotlight. Let's see. There's a uh, lot of light coming in from Ooh. here. Uh, can, if you can close that blind, that would help. Behind you. Can you close the blind to the window or, or close the shade? I think she just. Closed yeah, it, didn't and she? the other one is closed too. Oh, it is sure. closed. Yeah, it, the, all the blinds are actually closed, so it's still just a little bright. Yeah. Oh, 
Well, once you step into into frame, then it lights up, so it's fine. Okay. Thanks, Gino. <laughs> oh, this is good. I'm glad you came early so we could get everything hooked up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm definitely a food. This is going to be I'm looking forward yeah. to this. We're going to make a clover club. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Yeah, because <laughs> um, it, it's a really great drink to honor Margaret Brown oh, um, Margaret for many Brown. reasons. It's a really pretty drink. Um, it's not too strong, but it has a really you know robust flavor. And jokingly, uh, you know, with everything we've been through in these recent months, I love to say, you know, when life gives you lemons, make clover clubs. So, oh, I love, what page is this on so I can tell everybody? Uh, let me look at the exact page. <laughs> everybody, we're meeting with Veronica. Now, do I say your last name, Hink? Hinky. Hinky, okay, yeah. see? Because um, Amber's last name was, I thought it was Frick, but it was Fricky. So I, I've been saying your name wrong. Veronica oh, Hinky. I didn't even know that. Well, Thank um, thanks for, for checking. Yeah, because uh, you're not the only one I've pronounced their name wrong over the years. Although everybody's just reading on the book club, so they're not thinking, but I thought they could know. But this is, we're meeting with Veronica Hinky, author of this wonderful book that I got. But actually, did I ever tell you the story of how I found this? I was, I was in Barnes and Noble just I just like to go to Barnes and Noble and browse around and I just said I wonder what's you know if there's anything new in the Titanic section so I went up to like the you know history Titanic you know wherever that you know the codes this is the only book on the shelf in that section really? and I said I said what what is this I run a book club I've never heard of this before <laughs> so of course I bought it right away brought it home and was like oh <gasps> Oh my gosh. And I really enjoyed all your stories in here and your recipes. And I went on to the um, group and I was like, hey, everybody. And then that's when we ended up finding you. I got to pull that transcript because we had you before you came and you were so wonderful and chatted with us on Messenger for our book club meeting when we put you in for book of the month. <laughs> so it's really exciting to have you back. I that know. was so fun. I'm, I'm so glad to be back and I'm so glad we connected. I was wondering this morning, how did I meet Jill? I was trying to remember and <laughs> I I'm think so I just started met. looking for you. I was like, who is this person that wrote this book that I haven't heard about that I just randomly found and, <laughs> uh, on the bookshelf in Barnes and Noble? <laughs> you know, it was really amazing with my book. Um, I wasn't planning to write a book ever and not oh. this book. I wrote a magazine article about the wines and the aperitifs and the cognac and co other cordials that were found, the bottles at the remain site, at the Titanic wreck site. And I wrote it, I had to do something for the 100th anniversary year in 2012. And I wrote it for a wine enthusiast magazine. I pitched it to several magazines and it's always funny when people don't, editors don't pick something up and then they, somebody does, and it's a huge success. Like this, this 250 word article was such a big success. The New York Times blogged it, the Village Voice. Wow. Um, and then one day, I'll never forget, it was in the dead of winter in 2016. And I was doing something on my computer. I think it was a quiet Saturday night. And a publisher messaged me through a Facebook Messenger. Oh. And yeah, and he said, I saw this article, can you write a book? <gasps> and I thought, how would we write a book out of this little snippet of information? So I, I said, I don't think we can do this. <laughs> I, think, I don't think it is a book necessarily. And what I ended up doing was extrapolating from that point, that starting point, that magazine article, by looking at the people who were like Molly Brown, huge foodies of the, of the day and entertainers right. and popcorn vendors uh, from my hometown or popcorn vendor um, and looking at the menus. You know, a lot of people um, saved menus, they tucked them away just like I did when I was 16 and went to Paris as a foreign exchange student. I still have that menu from Air France and my keep away, keepsakes and 
Um, people did that on the Titanic, of course. So I, what I realized is that we know a lot about those menus that are out there that everybody knows about, but then there are so much more. Like when you look through um, the research online and in all the news stories that we can find now, uh, thanks to Google and newspapers.com, um, I found so many menus, even the crew menu, where we could see that they had uh, quail, or, or not quail, but plover, which is like a quail, like a seabird, um, you know, to honor the crew, at the, the seafaring crew. Just really neat little things like that. Um, white bait, and I delved into white bait a little bit to find out that um, there's a huge supper every year um, near Greenwich, England, and they have white bait. It's like a big festival for a, a close knit membership group of some gentlemen there that they've been doing for hundreds of years. So, um, you know, I learned so much and I just, I'm so happy to be able to share what I learned because I want others to hear about it too. And uh, especially in these recent months, these inspiring stories of people like Molly Brown who looked in the face of, you know, almost certain death at the point that they were at and still thought of other people and still thought to, you know, show appreciation to Captain Raskin. The picture of Molly with the group she formed. So yeah, it's been a it's been a wonderful culinary journey. Yeah, because she didn't even have a husband out there in the water. And here she was, you know, trying to get the lifeboat to go back, you know. It was it wasn't like she had any personal, she just couldn't stand the suffering of other people. And that's such a good point about her. And she was going through a divorce, which at that time was so, you know persona non grata, but yet she forged ahead and, you know, made a way for herself in that, in that whole culture and, and looked out for others at that time. What a, what a courageous woman. Yeah. And then on the Carpathia, uh, she worked on getting, you know, donations. I heard, I don't know if it's a rumor or not, but um, I heard that she had a, a board of people that donated and people that didn't donate up on this board, you know, trying to get oh really yeah I don't know if it was uh, but she definitely yeah she, she definitely honored and I loved your research that you did and your I think that's what I did when I first found your book and Barnes and Noble I was showing everybody look at her resources look at you know your resources are just extensive you know the amount of resources that you have and the amount of work because I know a lot of people here in the book club are really you know non-fiction readers we do have some fiction readers but people really want to know you know um the true stories and I think that's why people got a little upset with the movie because there's some um not true things in there so I think um myself I can really only speak for myself but really appreciate when someone really delves in and researches the, the true story because um you know, those are the things that people really want to know, you know, what's real and what's not. And then you mixed in these, the meals and everything. <laughs> well, I won't interrupt you anymore, but um, we're so glad that we found you. Well, I am too. And again, through Facebook and, you know, when you think of the meals you mentioned, Jill, uh, Facebook was really key in me connecting with people like Sonia Geyer, who contributed the tripe recipe that her grandmother made. Um, I found so many amazing people, just really dedicated food people like, like us um, that wanted to be part of the project. And it really became a collaboration. A lot of, um, you know, current day Titanic information, I think of it as people who are carrying on those traditions. And some of the traditions have really been, quite frankly, lost, like the Clover Club. It's one of the most fantastic um, drink recipes. I love it. It's colorful. It's really, um, you know, light and lively. I'm gonna look at and it. a lot of people don't know about it. The Robert Burns is a cocktail that I love that um, I just can't believe even now when I go into, a, well, these days I haven't been going into any bars, but um, before COVID-19, it was hard to find a bartender that knew what a Robert Burns cocktail was. 
Um, and it was also hard to find someone who knew what a Bronx was, which I love, the gin and orange juice combination. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that we can bring these, bring these back. Oh my gosh, yes. What was that? Was it the, what's the drink you're making again? I was going to look up. Uh, or did Clover you? Clover Club. Clover Club is on page 12. Oh, page 12, right. I wonder if I should type in the recipe into the comments. <laughs> oh yeah, because the Bronx is right on the, the one before that. I learned a lot of new names. I'm not a big drinker, but I learned a lot of new recipes. Okay. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not a big drinker myself, but I find that these are more of like, more of like a cultural type, just a nice, to have a drink or a toast. I know, and just to be fancy, toast. get out oh, a I fancy know. glass. <laughs> well, that makes it fun too when you get. Yeah, I like coupe glasses. Um, I'm a huge fan of, um, of uh, Ian Fleming and his, the, you know, the whole, the drinking culture that he celebrated and Ian Fleming loved a coupe glass and so do I. So um, I love to, most of these drinks I make in a coupe glass. So um, what was I gonna say about, oh, the Clover Club pot I'm gonna make that. And then I've got a slideshow for about 15 minutes, is that gonna be okay? okay? Yes, we can. And my slideshow is all about Molly. Just, I oh. took everything else out. We're just gonna focus on Margaret Brown today. Oh, I love that. And you guys watching, this is Margaret Brown's 153rd birthday or what would have been. And today the end, is. we'll all sing her happy birthday and we'll blow out a candle that I, virtual candle here that I have for her birthday, her 153rd. <laughs> That is so cool that you found a virtual candle. <laughs> well, there was one that you could actually blow the candle out. There is an app where, so if you're somewhere where you, um, where you can't, you know, get a hold of a candle or you can't light a candle, that you actually can blow that one out. This one you can't blow out, but it's a virtual cake. But um, the one, it only went up to two digits, that other app. So we needed one that was three digits. <laughs> That's very cool. Oh, and somebody asked a question here before we, I would, I would love to know if Titanic served instant pastum, the coffee substitute that was very popular at the time. Coffee. I haven't heard about that, that I'll have to look into that. Oh, um, really interesting, instant pastum? Po postum. Postum? Postum, it sounds familiar. Yeah, it's a it's a oh, yeah, like a co an instant coffee thing. Okay. Let me see if I can find the link. And I'll oh, post them. It's how it's pronounced. I want to know how post to pronounce them. your name. Cody? Is it Cody? Cody and Melissa. Cody. Hi. And Melissa just hi. got here too. Hi, Melissa. Yep. Hi. We're celebrating Margaret Brown's birthday today. She would have been a hundred. 53. Oh, Katie is how it's pronounced. Thank you, Katie. I like pronouncing. And I, I learned today that I've been saying Veronica's name wrong all this time. It's Hinky. Veronica. And I didn't even know because almost a year now we've been interacting through Facebook and through the book club, but I've never even heard your voice or hear, heard <laughs> you talk. So don't you love these Zoom sessions? Yes, because you can finally put a face when I first got to talk to Gino and Richard you know people I've been friends with forever well Gino and I do talk a lot on uh Richard and I do actually on um Facebook Messenger which we have not never done um it is it's so nice to finally put a you know see people because you know after a while everyone's just words on a page you know and it's hard to it's hard to get people's inflection or their sincerity. And I think a lot of times, sometimes there's a misunderstandings when you're trying to communicate through, you know, and now it's like, you can really see that these are real live people. <laughs> and yeah, uh, people just make their home. Especially surname pronunciation or name pronunciation. Uh, like for instance, you know, George Behe in South Africa, 
but overseas is George Behe. I know. You know? I say Behe. You know, I yeah. I'm not even positive if that's how he says it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever asked yeah, him. I've never heard it either. Because my last name is Carlier, because a lot of people say, we don't know how to pronounce your last name, or they say Carlier, and they say, oh. yeah. I Carlier. was saying Carlier, yeah. Yes. Just say Carlier. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and Jill, you're out of New England, right? I'm in New York, Rochester, New York. Oh, you're in Rochester, New York. Yeah. Right. So and then I have a son who lives in Leadville, Colorado. He just bought a house. So he wants to put some Titanic decorations up because, you know, oh, Margaret yeah, absolutely. Brown. Is from, How cool. I think he's a little more into Titanic now than he was because, you know, I've been studying oh, yeah. Titanic passengers for years. He's like, yeah, mom, whatever. But I think um, living right there in Leadville kind of got him more excited about, you know, trying to learn her story and everything. What are the chances of that, that your son would move to Leadville? How cool. Oh, I know. Well, he just, he, he, he drove a girlfriend out to Colorado because she wanted to, she just wanted a ride. And then he never came back. And then he found Leadville. And, and then I said, wait, Leadville? That's what I said, too. Because when I went to visit him, I wanted to go and see her house. But her house, we couldn't find it either. It's, uh, it's torn down or... Not to do another, but I'm, my friend Michael Lee lives in Colorado, and we went around to see um, historic sites. We went to the Molly Brown house, and we saw Molly's son's grave. It's in, um, I don't know if you've been out there, Lawrence. Okay. Straight up. Yeah, but I got, yeah, because I always thought Margaret Brown was so strong, like you said, just pioneer champion for for women, because we're also this month reading um, Kristen Iverson's book, The Unraveling the Myths. Um, she she yeah. actually did a lot of research into Margaret and then the Molly, the Molly Brown Museum ended up changing their whole um, curriculum for their speeches and everything because she unearthed all this new research because a lot of people were going by the, the unsinkable Molly Brown, you know, musical. And, and, you know, oh. Margaret, Margaret kind of got a, a bad, you know, you know, she's portrayed in movies as kind of like, you know, hillbilly and everything, which which wasn't true. Wow. That was just. Um, and know. she doesn't look hillbilly at all. Not in the photographs. Yeah. I know, because yeah. I just hate the way they make her sound and everything. When, yeah, when you um, look at this picture of Molly with these men. It was all men back then. You wouldn't yeah. find women in a group of collaborators working to honor Captain Rostron. And she was probably doing all the heavy lifting with the group. I mean, um, I'm guessing. Just Look at her. her, she's a strong it. woman. She carries yeah. herself well. She's very posture. And... Yeah, you don't see other first class ladies of the era doing that kind of stand up, you know, for the community, yeah. uh, right in the forefront, you know, she's in the front line of, of everything. Uh, that photograph uh, that you have there, Veronica, uh, was the first Titanic photograph that drew me to the story of the Titanic. And I have been staring mm -hmm. at that Molly Brown photograph for more than a decade, you know, like every pixel of it. I actually saw it, the first time I saw it was in uh, Jane uh, in uh, uh, in uh, the uh, Titanic uh, End of a Dream uh, mm -hmm. book. Uh, that's why I saw the picture the first time. And it's never left. I, I love it. I, you know, she's just so phenomenal. I mean, look at that hat. You know what I mean? Just... <laughs> yeah. And all the things that she's done. I've been taking notes while I read Kristen Iverson's book. And I know, I think you've talked to Helen Benzinger too, didn't you, when you were putting your book together? I sure did, and I'm going to share a few things in the presentation about things Helen shared with me, thank goodness. It, she was so wonderful to me, just uh, really terrific. I wish she could just go and play her great-grandmother sometimes so she could show us, you know, show yeah. the world, you know, what she would really like instead of all the, but people like you can help represent her properly, and we appreciate all your research and everything. Well, do you uh, want me to start making the drink? Sure. Do the demo now? All right. So, Cotty, <laughs> and there's um, 
Is it Katie, Alicia? Melissa? Oh, Alicia's here too. Hi, Alicia. Alicia, hi, everybody. Alicia's also a member of our team. Oh, great. What a great team. Thanks for all you do. This is oh, such a great book club. This oh, is one of the best book you. clubs out there for oh. any topic. Well, I always wanted to be part of a book club. So I thought, well, every time I talked to someone and they were like, oh, we only limit their numbers, can't join their library. So I was like, well, I love Titanic and I have a lot of Titanic books. And I think a lot of people like learning. There's just so much to learn. I mean, look, yes. at, what, look at what you gave us something new to learn because there's just always something new to learn about passengers, about, about the ship, about the food they ate. I mean, it's just so fun. People are like, Jill, what is your fascination? I'm like, there's just so much to learn. It's so interesting <laughs> to learn about how life was back then too. You know what they're Yeah, it really taught you a lot about Say that again, that? Gino. It's tribal the action it used to be. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, and we learn a lot about the cocktails too. The, the cocktails tell us a lot about what life was like. And there are some cocktails that are truly lost in time and they're fantastic. The Robert Burns cocktail, the, um, the Bronx, which is basically orange and gin. Oh, um, and the cocktail that I'm going to make for you today is the Clover Club. It's on page 12 of my book. Oh, yeah, I was, was going to, do you mind if I type it, the recipe into the chat here for the members? Oh, would and you? then they can Thank watch you, you do it. But, Thank okay. You. Thank you. That's really nice of you to do that because um, I um, didn't, didn't do that. So thank you. <laughs> um, so the, the, my book, The Lesson in the Titanic, was a real journey in putting together recipes like this one. Uh, this recipe came from the Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia at the uh, 19 restaurant, X1X, they use the Roman numerals. And it's a beautiful restaurant in Philadelphia, way up high, you get fantastic views of the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers. When you go up there, you can see all the way on both sides. Mm. And um, it's a phenomenal place. And it is the modern day restaurant where the group used to meet uh, called the Clover Club. And they invented this drink. And it became popularized, ironically, at Margaret Brown's fellow passengers uh, restaurant, the Waldorf Astoria in New York oh. City. And who, who can tell me who that was? That I won't uh, say. I'll let someone the else. The Waldorf Astoria. <laughs> you guys His know. Is coming up soon too. So come on, guys. Any guesses oh, from? Didn't it just? Did it just pass? I thought it was July thirteenth. Did it pass? I think so. If I if I'm I thinking about the right person. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I know you are. Um, you guys know so who it is? It's John Jacob Astor the Fourth. Yeah, so I think this, his first, I think his was on the thirteenth, but I could be wrong. It, <laughs> I think you're right. The, I'll tell you, this summer is going by so fast. I can't believe it's already past the thirteenth. I know. So so oh, John wow. Jacob Astor the Fourth was a a no brainer for someone to include in my book, and not just because he was this fantastically wealthy person who lived this incredible life, but because he was so influential in the restaurants and bars that we experience today. Um, the Bloody Mary was invented at the St. Regis many years after the Titanic, oh. but it, oh. there wouldn't have been a St. Regis if it hadn't been for John Jacob Esther IV. And he was in his forties when he lost his life aboard the Titanic. So it makes you wonder what else would this man have done? The incredible impact that he had on the world. Oh, um, the martini, some believe, was um, the martini as we know it today was invented at one of his um, hotels. And wow. um, the Clover Club is one of those drinks that has ties to him as well. So it was a no brainer to include the Clover Club. It's a fabulous Edwardian cocktail. I love it right now with everything that we've been experiencing together um, globally with the pandemic because I always say when, when I was a little girl, my mother's favorite book was Irma Bombeck's um, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries. Oh, I remember I always that. Love and so <laughs> I, I love that whole thought of like, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. 
And I say when life gives you lemons, make clover clubs because it has a little bit of lemon juice in it. So I squeezed a whole lemon and um, first I'm gonna put my ice in. I'm gonna just take a shaker. This is so fun. Uh, everybody's got a shaker. It makes me wanna have a party. <laughs> yeah, a, a birthday party for Margaret. Oh, I know. My and um, this is my lemon juice right here. I picked up the egg whites first and this is actually the lemon juice. There's a little bit of um, some pith in there. And you know what? I say, no, don't worry about the pith. It, it makes the drink feel more natural and organic. Um, take the seeds out, but those little extras, I think, really add to the organicness of this drink. Um, the white of one egg, and it's a cinch to separate eggs. Don't let anybody tell you different. Um, Do you need to stir that up or you just put it in like that? You don't have to stir it. with. I'm going to shake it. Okay. And I've got the a lemon peel that I peeled off of one of the lemons that I made the juice from. What I like to try to do is peel it as long as I can until it breaks. So I get a really nice long peel. So I'll throw that in there. And then I made raspberry simple syrup. And that's so easy. It's a cup of sugar, a cup of water, and some fresh raspberries, and you've got a simple syrup. So you pour that in there and Raspberries give it a really pretty color. And then the good stuff. I'm not a big drinker, but what I love about cocktails is the history and the culture. Um, I've got, I'm about an hour outside of Chicago here. So I have the Bee Feeder, Bee Chicago. Oh. I, you know, of all the different gins that are out there, I picked this one because it said Chicago on it. So pretty good marketing for Bee Feeder. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll put a jigger of that in there. And then I'm gonna use some lavender from my garden to use as a, instead of a um, bamboo shoot or other poker, I'm gonna use the stem of the lavender. I bought this tiny little lavender plant and it did great, grew into a great big lavender plant. And I'm gonna use that to put my raspberries on the garnish. I'm gonna put the Ooh. a few leaves and some um, buds of lavender in there for oh. a little extra flavor. Oh, so you added that because that's not in the recipe here. Right, yeah, the garnishes, okay. I didn't, I kept it just like the X1X restaurant had I it. I love so. that, that's All right, awesome. so are we ready to give it a shake for Margaret here? Yes. <laughs> Margaret, come in to her birthday. <laughs> Shaking things up here for Margaret's birthday. All right. So uh, now the fun part. I love straining out a beautiful clover club. See this beautiful color. Isn't that oh, pretty? Oh, that is pretty. Some of the little bits of raspberry sneak out and you can see the little raspberry buds. Now, I decided I wanted to, oh, I need to get my raspberry for the garnish. Let me get here. What did she put a sprig in there of you guys? Rosemary? Uh, I put in lavender. Oh, lavender. I'm going to put a that in. A little bit of lavender leaf. All right. Thank you. My and some term buds. <gasps> I, was, I'm I'm I think I'm going to make this for my girlfriends for happy hour because we, we yeah. try to do a little happy hours. That would be great, job. <laughs> so I'm going to take, these are really nice sturdy stems. So instead of a bamboo poker or a metal, um, Garnish poker. I'm going to just stick my raspberry oh, on there. Oh, that looks so pretty. And then I have a really special treat for Margaret Brown's birthday. I chose snapdragons from my garden oh. in honor of Margaret. Oh, because my God. As you know, it's Margaret different loved different. Asian influences and style at the time. She, you, you know, there's that popular photo of her with the umbrella and her. She loved all that Asian influence. And so a Snapdragon is perfect. Ooh, but more yes. than the real reason I wanted to go with a Snapdragon is because of this picture. Do you know, like you and I have been so moved by this picture. I chose a Snapdragon because Snapdragons, they symbolize oh, graciousness. Oh, I get a picture. Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, oh, yes. and it reminds me of like those Japanese cherry blossom, like that kind of prettiness. Yeah. Oh, 
so beautiful. So get a picture of this. Oh my gosh! So should we have a toast yes. to Margaret? <laughs> oh wow! I feel like I'm on one of those cooking shows, you know. But then you have to pass it around everyone. In the <laughs> It's just oh wonderful. God. And <gasps> oh. I think Margaret would have liked it a lot. Um, the Snapdragon represents graciousness. And I was thinking about her yeah. and how I handle things like with the pandemic. And, you know, when I would have been on the Titanic, I, if I had been on the Titanic, I wouldn't have been thinking about who can I thank, right? What, we don't think about that. Who can we say thanks to? Who can we show appreciation to? And yet there's so many people that help us through anything from the pandemic to, you know, um, last night getting, or just tonight, today getting connected. I was thinking about something that happened last night. I, I couldn't see my ingredients the way I wanted to. And Kim from the Molly Brown house helped me out. Oh. So many times, like, you know, you guys making the connections for this today. So many times there are things that people do that we just take for granted. Um, and so Molly's influence really has taught me gratitude to be gracious. Um, I'm going to start my PowerPoint. Let's see if I can show you my desktop. I haven't done this in a while. Uh, screen share. So do I need to give you a screen share? Do you have it? Oh, uh, I, mean, I, I, might have it. To, I might have to open it up to screen share because- Oh yeah, to... you do. Hold on, because we had a little uh, intruder the other day, and uh, oh, you did. Been sharing some nuts. You okay. you should be able to make her a co-host, and she should be able to get in it. Oh, co-host. Okay, let's see. I think I got it. Okay, good. Here Can you go. see now? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm oh, sorry to hear somebody got in there, and yeah, it was a little disturbing and dramatic, but <laughs> we're. We handled it. Yeah. Um, oh, I think I what I'm going to do move this over so that I can uh, navigate a little better and still keep my backdrop. There we go. Okay, that's what I wanted. So, this is a picture that you see behind me. Um, Margaret Brown, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm sure many of you do, but Margaret took it upon herself to be part of a group of people aboard the Carpathia after they were rescued on the morning of April 15th. Uh, they wanted to organize a way to thank Captain Rostron. That's Captain Rostron there holding the cup. So this of course was, you know, weeks, maybe even months after the disaster. Um, many people would have wanted to just move on with their lives and just move forward and Molly couldn't do that without thinking about who to thank and took time out of her very busy schedule to work with these gentlemen uh, and as I noted earlier all men in her day it was a, a very much a man's world and she did not let that affect her at Aww, all strong woman yeah so much we have so many people to thank and ourselves from history and Molly is certainly one of them. Here's a picture I love of her and Captain Rostron. Um, in August 1987, a diver found a gold nugget necklace and it is believed that it must have be belonged to Molly because of course the mining connection with her husband's um, mining businesses and um, so that's all we know. We don't know for sure who owned that gold nugget necklace, but I like to believe that it was probably one of Margaret's. Why? Margaret was known oh. for saying a longer quote than this actually, but um, what her great granddaughter told me about Helen Benzinger told me that one of her quotes that should go down in history, which really does give you a good sense of her personality and her spirit is I'd rather marry a poor man that I loved than a rich man that I didn't. And so even though her husband Aww. made so much money as a miner, you know, working in the mining industry, um, she still felt that she wouldn't have married him if he 
if she would have married him even if he did not have the money that he had at the time they were not wealthy when they got married i love this picture i was talking earlier about how uh, the people who are featured in my book are people who were aboard the titanic who had a food connection and margaret certainly did through her incredible entertaining she was an amazing hostess she was an activist who hosted programs in her home and she also entertained for friends and so forth um, and she was an incredible philanthropist. This is one of my favorite pictures of Margaret because it's behind one of her tables that she set for a party. Yeah. I've so been in that room. Is that in the Molly Brown house there? In yes, it is. And one of the stories that Helen told me, her great granddaughter, is that Mar Margaret used to take all the books out of her bookshelves and she would replace them at Valentine's Day with only red books. <gasps> oh, yeah. wow. For the book club, isn't that a great story? That's and a then, great story. Yeah, and she would replace those a few weeks later for St. Patrick's Day with only green books. Oh, oh my gosh. So we know that Margaret loved to celebrate. We know I she did. In fact, this is her punch bowl. And I was able to get a picture of it from the um, Denver, the um, Historical Society to include in the book. And, and so, you know, there might be someone that would think, why would you include a punch bowl from Molly Brown's house in the Titanic book? But I wanted to show what these people's lives were like from a food yeah. perspective uh, on and off the boat. We can only assume uh, that if they, enjoyed certain things off the boat they probably had the same customs and things on the boat margaret was a yodeler a... oh i didn't know that <laughs> yeah so um i've been trying to learn a little a little yodeling myself i've been um inspired by her to look at some youtube um uh, videos that instruct you about yodeling and basically it's some what the kind of things that Margaret would yodel are like this. A little olehu, a little olehu. So she really had fun with that. She would yodel for her guests at her home. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so neat. Now there's a huge connection with Molly's uh, philanthropy and hospitality with the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver, which is still there. And where the staff have told me that Margaret is still known for having a heart as big as a ham. Now, this quote is from one of the movies about where Margaret was featured. And Helen Benzinger, her great granddaughter, clarified for me that she never actually had that quote attached to her in real life. Um, nobody ever said to her, you know, oh, you have a heart as big as a ham. But they like to say that at the Brown Palace Hotel to people like me who call and ask. Uh, because they really still remember her as quite the philanthropist. Right. Molly handed out Christmas gifts to people in person at the hotel, to every housemaid, bellman, doorman, and server. We should certainly be celebrating her today on her birthday because um, how many people would be doing that sort of thing when she could be at a party with all of her um, fabulous friends that she had? She even provided the Brown Palace Hotel staff with a little Christmas tree for the front desk. And she held fundraisers at the Brown Palace Hotel for some of the many causes she helped with, including Catholic Charities, the Dumb Friends League, which is mm -hmm. it's not about a, a disability group. It's about um, animals welfare. So yeah, my, my, a, my yeah, son's girlfriend adopted her dog from the Dumb Friends League. It's still around. It's still around. It's still Isn't around. that wonderful? <laughs> yeah. I, I think of it as one of the first humane societies. And of course, yeah. Helen was, or, uh, Margaret was involved. Um, here's another Titanic tie-in. There's you know, that tie-in that I um, explained about the Clover Club and John Jacob Astor IV. And this is one with Benjamin Guggenheim, who was also on board the Titanic with Molly in 1900. They had a holiday banquet at the hotel for 1,500 of wow. Denver's less fortunate. That's, wow. I mean, I just saw the other day, I think yesterday, Gail Gand, who is featured in my book, 
did a wonderful meal for 20 homeless men at, through one of the organizations in our area. And I was amazed by that. And here, you know, 1500 people, that's amazing. And that's about the number of souls lost on Titanic. That would, that would be an astronomical amount of people to be at a banquet. A lot of people. So on the night of, now we're going to get into the sad parts, but it's uplifting yeah. in many ways too. So don't be too sad um, yeah. because Margaret made it that way. She turned it into a, a learning experience for everyone, even today. Margaret was in lifeboat six on April 15th. Um, of course, the boat hit the iceberg at 11.40. And so by the morning of the 15th, the lifeboats were all out in the water. So that's why I referred to April 15th. The quartermaster of the Titanic was Robert Hitchens. And he was in lifeboat six as well. So um, I'm going to go back to this picture of Robert. This picture, this is a good picture of him. Um, Robert Hitchens had concerns about going back towards the Titanic to retrieve other passengers out of the water or out of lifeboats that were overfilling, overfull. Um, and Margaret was very insistent that she wanted him to go back. And so they, they really butted heads. They didn't get along that night. There was some tension. Um, Margaret was able to compartmentalize and just move into her helping others mode. And she organized the women in her lifeboat, lifeboat six, to row to stay warm. So, you know, what an organizer to be thinking about that. Here you are out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You know, everyone else is probably just thinking of themselves. It's pitch dark out. You could only see, um, you couldn't even see your hand in front of you. In fact, they were lighting ropes so that for a few seconds, you can maybe see the, the lit tip of a rope, for instance. Oh, Molly organized a group of women to row to keep warm. So I've um, heard amazing stories of what she did in that lifeboat. And then, as we talked about with this picture here, once she was finally aboard the rescue ship Carpathia, she distributed food, handed out cups of drinks, passed out blanket after blanket, and then as Jill, as you were saying, while well, she was right on, right as soon as she was aboard the Carpathia, she organized a fund for those who would be most in need when the Carpathia reached New York City. They raised nearly $10,000. Today, this would be worth almost $250,000. Margaret was not settling down from after, she never kicked back after the Titanic when many of us would wanna say, I survived, I'm done, I, now I wanna just chill out, go on a vacation. No, she was unable to testify in the US Senate hearings because she was a woman. However, she persisted in doing what she could. She helped organize the Titanic Memorial in Washington, DC. She galvanized others to fight for workers' rights uh, women's rights and education. She uh, worked to start the first juvenile court and she helped organize the National Association of Women's Suffrage. Even before the 19th Amendment, Margaret ran for office for a seat in the Colorado Senate in 1901. And in 1914, just two years after surviving the Titanic, and the reason I accentuate that is because so many people would be just still, you know, trying to recover from that experience. But two years after the Titanic, Margaret ran for U.S. Senate. Wow. She organized an international women's rights conference in Newport, Rhode Island in 1914. And she even started, I'm still not getting gotten through all this yet. She started a support branch for soldiers in France during World War II. Wow. So Margaret continued her whole life. She spent her entire life working in benevolent capacities and she passed away in her sleep from an aneurysm at the Barbizon Hotel in New York City in October, 1932. And that always really touches me because I love New York City in fall in October. I just, that's one of my most, you know, those are some of my most heartfelt memories. And I think of her um, 
uh, being alone again like you had mentioned Jill about her being alone on the Titanic there she was alone at the Barbizon Hotel in New York and that is where her life ended and um, I'm so pleased to have been able to spend this time with you all today to talk about her and her legacy on her 153rd birthday. Um, that concludes what I wanted to go over in the slides. Um, if there are questions or conversation, we can continue on with, with that. Oh, that would be so great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'd love that we did this. We decided to do this and you decided to do this on Margaret's birthday because it's just such a, a wonderful um, testament to Margaret Brown. So what Thank do you, doing? yeah. Um, did we stop uh, sharing? Oh, there we go. There we go. Let's go to let go to speaker Perfect. view. Can you see everybody now? Let's see. Oh, it's canceled. Yeah, I can see oh, now you can see everyone. Uh, you know, I just learned in over the last several months that Margaret was also instrumental in um, that memorial, uh, the Titanic Lighthouse in New York City that's currently um, doing fundraising to be, um, what's the word? Restored. Refurbished, restored. Yeah, they're restoring. Um, that they're working on getting money together to restore that Titanic Lighthouse and and Margaret, that's just one other thing. I'm sure there's so much that she's she did that we just don't even know. Look at that long line of lists of things that she did that we know about. It's really amazing. And so I, I'm so glad that we landed on this date. We were trying to think, gee, when should we do this? And it just makes sense to celebrate her birthday. Yes. Does anybody want to say hi or ask a question? I have a question. Actually, I have two. Thank you, Richard. Um, I noticed your shaker. Uh, that one has the built-in strainer in the lid. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I'm a I'm a the the shaker I have has uh, doesn't have the lid. I use a glass and one of the uh, famous Hawthorne uh, strainers. Usually. Oh, neat. So, so I was just uh, wondering if, if that was strained. Um, second question, are you a um, Fred Harvey fan? You know Fred Harvey from the uh, Santa Fe, actually some speaking Santa I'm also a railroad historian and, and I really oh. like the, the whole um, system that Fred Harvey set up and all the uh, the uh, Harvey houses and uh, I, I get into the recipes there. The uh, one of my favorites is the uh, famous Santa Fe uh, French toast that they, they would make in the uh, dining cars for breakfast. So I was just wondering if you had an interest in that at all. Oh, I sure do. And thanks for bringing that up. Um, it's funny because I learned about that after my book came out, somebody said to me, you should do another book about the Harvey houses. And I, I sure would love to. Um, what a great thing to research. And I would love to do that. And so thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, you're welcome. I, we had a Harvey house uh, here, I think, in our train depot. Um, it, the, our depot was actually featured in one of the um, Atlas Shrug movies. Uh, they uh, use the uh, the depot we have here in Pueblo, and uh, I, I actually was the uh, curator of the railway museum here for a while. Uh, so, oh, wow. um, you know, I'm I'm not an amateur historian by by any means, but uh, I am a foodie, and I I do love uh, my uh, drinks. Uh, I don't like getting drunk, but I do like to drink socially, and and. Yeah. Uh, so I can't wait for your book to come. Hopefully it's in the mailbox today. Oh, great. Yeah, what I love about my book is that it celebrates those historical drinks that I think we need to start drinking more of. Not, I'm not trying to advocate for heavy drinking by any means, but just <laughs> the culture. I think they, they bring such an element of culture to a, a party or a meal. Yeah, I'm a big, I, I, I'm, I'm not a huge passenger guy. Uh, but I like the ship, but I, I, mean, I mean, I'm into the hardware nuts and bolts of the ship, but I really like the culture of the time, the whole Edwardian, Victorian 
uh, era is just, you know, I do graphic art and that's where I special, I love specializing in that Edwardian ephemera is just, uh, you know, nobody does that stuff anymore. And uh, it's just such a great, great time period in history to study. Very distinct from any other periods. Like when you think of people ask me, well, what is, what really, you know, is symbol symbolic of the um, Edwardian era? What would be emblematic? And I think of Mary Poppins, um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Oh. Those are those looks and that, that whole style. And it was very distinct from the Victorian era and from any era that followed. Oh, wow. I have a question if I may. Um, Veronica, your, your, your book's uh, cover is, is so outstanding. It's, it's, it's very standout. I love it. Uh, like, how, how did that come about? How did, how did you decide on that cover? That's really, really cool. It's funny you ask because we went through a lot of renditions and drafts for over a year. And I actually think people were even changed in and out because they really, the publisher really wanted this book cover to be special. And I think they accomplished their mission. I, I, I love the book cover. I have actually, um, the woman who lives in Captain Smith's house right now in England contacted me because she wanted to be able to use the cover for something. I mean- Oh, I think we had her in the book club. What's her name? Oh, I have to look up her name. Um, I can't. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but I think we had her in the group. She was she wrote a book, right? About her yes, living in Captain Smith's house. I can't think of her name. We'll talk about it later, but I know okay. who you mean. <laughs> um it, yeah, the, the cover has gotten a lot of great praise and it deserves it. It was a fantastic it beautiful. piece of work. And um the collage I think really works well and I love the colors. So thank you, Gino. Oh yeah. That's really yeah. great. He, were, he works really hard on doing graphics. He helped us set up our website, our new website that we have for the book club. Oh, the website's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, Jill's also done a lot of good work there. Uh, it's, I mean, we we first had a, like a red color at the background, and, you know, we thought that was working. And then Jill said, no, she might want to do a different color, and then went all yellow at one stage. And I was like, wow, this really pops, and it just works. And, <laughs> Next time I visited, you know, she had the whole thing laid out, you know, the way she wanted it. And, uh, you know, everything was just working, like, you know, because she knows what's on the agenda, what's got to go into it and everything. So, yeah, kudos on that, Jill. So, yeah, she did well, one of our job. members, Andre, he sent me a, 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 a color generator so you could put the colors that you like and it lets you know yeah. all the... <laughs> It's like, oh, neat. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, have a, I have another question, if I might, uh, about Molly Brown. Uh, I suppose, you know, I suppose even Richard could answer this. Uh, but there's a line that was used in the a Night to Remember movie that uh, Molly Brown said that her husband had cemented silver dollars in the floors of every room, you know, as, as a kind of... Oh. Um, as a kind of gimmick. I think it was a gimmick in the script. I don't think it's historically accurate because I suppose, you know, if it were, there'd be a lot of people robbing Molly Brown's house right now, you know? So, right. But uh, I think it's a really interesting gimmick that because uh, it, it was uh, it was such a standout idea that she was so illustrious and so far out that she would be doing something like that. You know, um, I've like Jill, I've been really fortunate to be able to visit the Molly Brown house. And that sounds to me like something they would have highlighted if it had happened. Yeah. Um, I would think that she would have been living in Leadville at that time. Yeah, maybe. I think that's the Leadville house. I don't think that's the yeah, Denver. Leadville, Colorado, yeah. That's all oh, Leadville, was, okay. Yeah. Because that's uh, where they, you know, got their, found that. the gold and all that. Uh, that that's oh. what I would think. Because my, they didn't go there. My ex-wife is from Leadville, was born there, and we've got oh. family there. So oh. um, I, I've spent a lot of time uh, up there, and uh, I haven't found their house, but I know the mines, and especially Baby Doe, that's a, a, a neat story, too. 
for people to uh, look at it, the legend of Baby Doe. So. Well, I couldn't find her house either when I went. But then there's her summer house I would love to go to. Have you been there, Veronica, to her? No, and I would love to go. Yeah, I would love to. Gina, I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I had not heard that before. Or if I heard it, it just wasn't something it was I remember. Something she, she said at the dinner table, right? She said, yeah. and night to re the movie, A Night to Remember. The and I just, I, I watched... Yeah, I watched the movie in April and I didn't see, I don't remember hearing that. I'll have to go back and watch it. That's, that's and then the passenger question. to her right says to her, he comments and says, how very thousand for you. <laughs> 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 yeah, because I suppose, you know, they, I suppose, you know, they, they were splashing, you know, their money, you know, and uh, upgrading themselves in every possible way when they did become rich you know because i mean you got money you're gonna spend it like i suppose you know anybody mm -hmm. would you know but uh spending it on silver dollars cemented in the floors i think it's a little far-fetched i don't think it would be, <laughs> it's one of those it's extravagant far margaret brown stories that you hear because yeah. they just make her seem so like you know yeah the way they make her talk and yeah i would love to just see a video of her you know so we can see how because she just seems like she carried herself you know she, oh, she carried well, that hat you know what i mean it's like a yeah. oh i love those hats hat. so phenomenal how they did not have neck pain you know at yeah. night from, from wearing the hat all day <laughs> Well, they, yeah, you know what's interesting that, that I noted in this, I noted through Kristen I, Iver, is it Kristen Iverson, right? Am I saying right. it right? Chris, her book where she writes about Molly, um, I noticed, I started thinking about this. I've always thought of Molly as a very robust woman, and she wasn't. Look at that tiny waist. Yeah, she's so tiny. She, she was teeny tiny, and Yet, you know, she was always portrayed in the movies as this large woman. And, um, you know, in Kirsten's book, um, I noted how she talked about her walking laps on the deck, how she you know, was probably out exercising and um, she really tried to stay fit. She really, she worked hard for that figure. And it's amazing how all these years later in history, there's a tendency to think of her as a, a larger woman. Well, a lot of those figures are artificial because the uh, corsets of the day were uh, actually, uh, the way the women wore them actually pulled the waist in and caused a permanent shift in the organs. Um, because the corsets, they, they put them so tight that it caused health problems. It caused a lot of health problems. So, um, a, a lot that but that was the in thing is to to wear a tight corset for women at the day and it's uh uh yeah yeah and you don't you don't see that it's tight because the dress might be loose but right as you're saying still, underneath yeah dress, not a big woman like you know even a big woman wouldn't be able to get that tiny with a corset <laughs> yeah yeah but I mean, oh, so hi, it, Eli. We just said Eli join us. Just Eli's second. coming here all the way from <laughs> Israel, guys. Cool. Oh, how cool. <laughs> and hi. He's, like, he's an author as well. He wrote Hello. about the Jews on Titanic. <laughs> oh, neat, <laughs> Eli. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you're here. I have a question for him when we're done. Yeah, when we're done, we can all have a free chit chat. <laughs> Uh, Are you there, Eli? Uh oh, he froze up. I wonder I he if froze. He's... He froze up. Oh, I hate when that happens. I was thinking there's a connection there with Benjamin Guggenheim then to this presentation. It, you know, talking about Benjamin Guggenheim. Hi, Eli. There Hi. He is. <laughs> I talked a little bit in my book about the kosher kitchen aboard the Titanic and the the kosher. Wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 wait. Hi, who are you? <laughs> Hi. Oh, I thought you were joining the program. Hi, I'm Veronica. That's you're Veronica. The Can you see her, Eli? Have yeah, you yeah, been yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, okay. Wait, wait. She's the uh, author I, of the book. Our, the... Yeah, I, I just came in the middle. Okay. <laughs> are, are, are on this thing right now. There's um, there's eight of us. 
Eight of us. Veronica, okay, the oh. author. Myself, okay. Gino Martin. Veronica's the author. From, okay, good. Yes, Veronica's the author. Gino's here from South Africa. I forgot where you are, Melissa. Hi, Gino. Wait, are, Hi, Gino, are you the guy who built that big model? Yes. Gino's oh, built wow. the largest Titanic model in South Africa. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't know that, Gino. We're going to get him on yeah, Zoom. That, we yeah, can my teach everybody is, about is him. Here. The background is Tintanic, uh, the model, uh, the hull of it with the rivets and the little portholes and uh, all the little plating and so on. Before she was painted black. And uh, oh. I just quickly popped out to a different room because I wanted to show you this. Um, I don't know if you can see it. So can... it's a little Molly Brown. Oh, wait, let me, let me spotlight oh. you because I can spotlight you so you can be bigger. There we go. Oh, wow. did you do that? <laughs> did you yeah, make so she that? Was one of the first figurines that I made for the Tintanic. He model. made that. That's the oh scale of the ship talented. that you built. <laughs> he's, he's really talented. You know, that's you the sure scale are. of the ship. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is this is the scale that's of the, scale. the ship, and this is this is the scale of the people on the Tintanic. Yeah. Wow. It makes little people and he makes furniture. It's really fun. Wow. I'll see if I can get a picture up uh, in the background of my Tim Tannic. Uh, so Are you in a hurry of anything, Veronica? Are you good? Oh, I'm good. Okay, yeah. good. This is his oh, model. Okay. He was in the mall there in South Africa. Oh, wow. oh Gino. How wonderful. <laughs> Wow, 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 that is a oh my goodness. Let's see how he makes the people. The people. Oh, Gino. Do you know wow. how many rooms do you have furnished? He's got um several rooms furnished. The Tintanic has got more than 4,000 rooms on the inside. Uh, so she's built pretty much 90% to blueprints. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to still furnish and decorate each and every room on the inside. I think we might just do everything that's visible on the outside and then just do bigger sets on the outside around the model. So uh, we'll have to see how that all pans out. But uh, yeah, certainly a massive, massive task. And I miss my boat very much. I can't be with her right now because of COVID. She's in storage down in Durban on the coast of Kazumu Natal. Uh, but we are gonna go uh, with a virtual exhibition which is called Virtually Unsinkable. Uh, and it's a 360 degree virtual exhibition of the Tintanic that will be available on the Tintanic website. Uh, so question. people can actually visit it as if they're there. So they can actually walk have... up to the model. They can look at the cabinets. They can look at all the rec models and all the miniatures. Uh, Gino, I have a question. Down. Yeah, you Eli. Uh, my question is, Is it does it have electricity? Like the lights go on and stuff? Well, we did actually start with uh, some lighting at the beginning of 2019. And uh, it was very complicated with all the wiring on the inside of the model. And uh, I was just about to put the lights on for the first time. And then there was this big boof explosion of smoke in the middle of the ship. And the, it and came from the bunker. The roof, and the roof had already been sealed. So, you know, it was a, we had to act fast to get to the flames. Uh, so, uh, we had to put that out. Luckily, we did because the whole thing is built out of wood on the inside. So um, we narrowly escaped a uh, a Normandy situation. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, we'll we'll still do all the lighting. I'm just gonna do little LEDs. I think you can see a few LEDs on the on the uh, on Captain Smith quarters at the on the boat deck. You know, you can see that must have taken a lot of uh, detail because you have everything to scale so well. Each window, and I mean, it's just amazing, Gino. Thank now, you. Gino, we should get a little commercial to run at the end of our Zoom so we can get people excited about your event. Maybe we'll work on that for, for the next meeting <laughs> or before the event starts. He's really put a lot of work into his model. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of science behind it with measuring things and unbelievable. And then what a nice experience for people to be able to get up close to it, where it's not life size, but it's still a size that you can get a sense of what it was like. 
yeah, it was, re it's, I mean, it's, it's really a massive model. It's uh, 27 feet long. And uh, that's, that's kind of huge, you know, for, even for South African standards. When I go away on holiday or I go away to a different city, you know, for a couple of months and end and I come back and I see her, I go, oh, she's so big. Why did I go so mm. big? But it's her size that sells her. It's her size that makes her so special. You know, if she was just a small little Titanic model, she wouldn't have had the impact that she's got. I've had right. a lot of times when uh, I've had a lot of times when we go to a mall, um, especially like in, in one of the malls in Johannesburg, when we moved in overnight, the, the marketing manager would just tell me like, you can just bring it up the escalator. You know, it's like <laughs> they believe it's so small, you know, oh, and you're like... get there the next day and this thing's standing the whole mall, you know, full. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it was quite interesting. Um, Very but, interesting, yeah. And, and of course, you know, the Titanic is only 90% to, to scale, so because she has to fit through South African doorways, so she couldn't have been the full width of the of the real scale. So we kind of cheated it a little bit, we just made it slightly narrower. And you can see it if if you're aware of it, then you realize, oh yeah, she's a little bit narrower. But um, other than that, you can't really tell. She looks great. I'm really amazed. That's that's amazing. Is your grand opening September 1st, Gino, for your event, or did you move that date? Uh, we are, well, the website is launching on the 1st of September, and uh, then the website will be open with all the blogs and all the videos, uh, but the 360-degree virtual exhibition only uh, only activates on the 1st of December. December. And uh, we're, we're launching the 360-degree virtual exhibition on the 1st of December, for, for the specific reason, because my birthday is on the 6th of December, so it's a little happy birthday to me present. Yeah, so. Nice. <laughs> what a great, there's a good plan too. Definitely. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys heard, but the, there was a fundraiser last night for the Molly Brown house and um, Veronica went. Did you do the same kind of thing yesterday? Did you do a recipe for everybody? I did. I, I had the wonderful honor and experience of making a cocktail for the the kickoff of the uh, performance by Nelia Petrovic. And um, she did a beautiful um, concert for us of her songs from her new uh, musical, Rattlesnake Kate. Oh, Nelia yeah, Petrovic. She's wonderful. I'm look that up. Yeah. When I when I joined a couple of minutes ago, the first thing you said, Veronica, is something about the kosher kitchen. Let's get back to that. Yes, please. Oh I, yes, I, yeah. Really... She was giving the. And I also talked a little bit before you came on, Eli, about uh, the wonderful um, dinner that Margaret Brown hosted with Benjamin Guggenheim at the Brown Palace Hotel uh, before they were co-passengers on the Titanic. They were good For... friends. They were good friends from Colorado. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, they did a lot of really impactful things together. And um, so yeah, I delved into quite a bit of the kosher foods that were aboard the Titanic. Not a whole book on it like you did, but I, I definitely had that in my sights. I, can, I can you tell me a, something that I don't know about the kosher food? One of the questions that intrigued me was, the only information I had about kosher food uh, had to do with third class, the steerage, because that's where the, the, the Jewish passengers wanted the food. The Jewish passengers from first and second class weren't really into kosher food, like Guggenheim right. and also uh, Zalfeld and other, other uh, uh, Jews uh, didn't care about what they were eating. But one of the questions that I have unanswered was if a first class passenger wanted kosher food, was it available for him? Third class, you mean? First class. First class. What if, my understanding what, is yes. My understanding is no. Because oh. the, the, the kosher food was available for third class. So if, oh. if, if a first class passenger wanted kosher food, he would, pr he would practically eat third class food. I've, I've, my assumption is that my, my assumption all along in my research was that that's probably what happened. 
with people that were very um, adherent to kosher laws and rules and customs would be if that was the only kosher food that was available. But I also got the impression that that probably didn't happen very often. You know, like you were saying that, that they weren't interested in it. Um, it. It's interesting, you know, and we'll never know for sure. Uh, a hint towards, uh, towards an answer. I read recently on a sea of glass um, and I, I, I came up with a very interesting story of a first class passenger who said an anti-Semitic remark when she was standing in line at the purser's office uh, uh, for uh, seat arrangements for the dining saloon. And she said that the, the person in front of her was Jewish and he was very fussy about his arrangement. So I'm thinking, was it because that specific uh, 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 Jewish passenger was concerned about Jewish food and kosher food? And that's what took him so long when he was at the person's office. That, that that's the Jewish passenger's name is unknown. So I would never right. know. Right, and I, I always assumed that the kosher food would have been available to all classes. You know, and I, as far as maybe that's the discussion they got into was um, why isn't there a kosher chef on board that's just for first class? I think there was just one kosher chef. I know that there was a, a, a kosher uh, supplier that supplied all the kosher food. But only for third class. Yeah, but they. I was. I was told that that the uh, the research that I've done looks like that if the uh, a first or second class passenger wanted to coach your meal, that was all done. You know, they would get the same meal as a third class passenger, yeah. which in those standards was not that. You know, I mean, you look at a lot of the other ships that were out there, and a third class kosher meal would probably be a first class meal on a, on a lesser ship like the Californian or, or something like that. But my big question is, is where is the kosher kitchen? I've been pouring over the blueprints mm -hmm. and I can't find uh, a specific kosher area. And I had a discussion with a Jewish friend of mine and uh, my thought would be the cooking utensils and everything would be kosher, but maybe they use the same ranges and stoves and, and everything and ovens that um, the regular food was prepared in. It was just uh, prepared in, in, uh, in specific kosher vessels. But I, you know, I can't find the kitchen. I would like to know where that area was where the kosher kitchen was on the Titanic. Uh, Richard, you and me both, I looked, scoured through the maps too and didn't see anything either. And I, I didn't know what that indicated, if maybe, I mean, there must have been something because you can't have kosher food without a kosher kitchen. Um, do, so, do you know the famous photo of the kosher kitchen from the Olympic? Yes. Okay. Uh, so that room is very, very small. It's not even a kitchen. It must have been just a place to, to, to hold the food. And the kosher food, uh, most, most foods don't have a kosher problem, uh, fruits, vegetables, and so on. The only problem is meat. So all you need is a place to, to, to have the meat stored and a place to cook the meat Everything else, and, and the dishes. And everything else is not a problem. Yeah, but the, the knives and everything you use for vegetables. The, the, the utensils. Yeah, the utensils and, and, and everything have to be remain. Um, you can't cut meat with them or anything else. They've got to just be dedicated. For you, need, you need separate sinks. You need separate uh, 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 cutlery. You need, you need a, a stove. You need a working area. You know, I mean, but that I can't find. I mean, the pantry. A kosher pantry, yeah, but as far as actually preparing the meals, actually cooking, you know, I don't know where that is, and I wish wish I knew because that's uh, that's been a, a huge. I'm not Jewish, but um, my uh, my Christ my my spirituality touches on the uh, 
kind of on that uh, note. Um, but still, it's um, something that I've always wanted to know is, is where and how uh, the uh, kosher meals were prepared on the on the Titanic. It's it's really been uh, been something I've been been trying to figure out for the last five or six years. I I've dove into that and and I've got all the information I was able to get and I and I wrote about it in my book. But as far as I remember, uh, I do not know the location of the kitchen either. Yeah, interesting. Um Sorry, from building the Titanic, um, I don't remember anything in the plan or in the floor plans that actually specified a specific Jewish kitchen uh, for first class, because of course first and second class dining rooms shared the shared a kitchen, um, but I don't remember any specific area being signed off for it. What about third class? Uh, third class, I believe, had their own dining room dining room. Uh, kitchen uh so they their meals were prepared separately but first and second definitely um shared a kitchen as well as the cafe parisien uh i think it was it was a cart they also shared with the kitchen first and second but as far as a special uh jewish kitchen or special jewish section went I don't recall seeing anything. I didn't see anything in the first class area, and I don't remember seeing anything in the third class kitchens either. I, I did so. find the room where the kosher chef uh, 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 stayed. Kennel? But, that, but that's not an indication for anything. Are you thinking of kennel? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know what room he was at, but that doesn't that's mean amazing. anything. That's amazing. Yeah. Charles Kennel. Yeah. Um, well, I am so delighted that we could get together today. Thank you all so much. And um, this group is just amazing. I'm so glad I'm a part of it. And thank you guys all for behind the scenes, everything you do, Jill, with connecting with me and others. And um, happy birthday to Margaret Brown. Do our candle. Yes, Jill's candle. Jill has a virtual candle. Oh, on mute. All right, here we go. Do you, do you guys want to sing her happy birthday to Margaret? <laughs> yes, let's do it. Here we go. One, two, three. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Margaret. Happy birthday to you. I'm raising my glass to you too, Margaret Brown. <laughs> I'm gonna unspot. Oh my gosh, and this is so wonderful. Um, Veronica, you're just so wonderful and you're inspiring me. You know, my girlfriends have been coming over. We have just like a little happy hour once in a while, but you know what? I'm going to make it a little more exciting. <laughs> Yay! Good. Because <laughs> I think they would like that. Usually, usually they just bring a bottle of wine and we all just share that. So um, yeah. I think they would think this is really fun. <laughs> Did anybody have anything they wanted to say before? She goes. I mean, we can all stay and chit chat with each other. And you guys on Facebook, you're welcome to come and join us for, you know, chit chatting. Just thank um, you, Veronica, for uh, doing this and uh, coming up and having a chat about your book. Uh, it was really insightful. Uh, I think we all learned a lot about Molly, uh, Margaret, it's open. Um, and uh, I, you know, again, congratulations on your book cover and that it's going so well. And, uh, you know, thank you, thank you so very much for, for keeping the story alive. You know, you're one of those people that will never be forgotten because, you know, you remembered someone from Titanic. So thank you from South Africa. Thank yeah. you, Gina. And I really encourage you guys to pick this up, the, the resources and the, you know, she really did her research. It's not just one of those books.
books that people just, you know, oh, I want to write a book for the anniversary. Um, I don't know if you got you guys were here when she, you know, said that somebody came to her, you know, and said, would you write? But what was what was the magazine you did your Wine, article for? Wine Enthusiast. Yeah, so, um, and the editor, I don't know if you can see the. Uh, oh, is this the poster um, from? It's Susan uh, Christoyer. Let me, let me give you some. Wine Enthusiast. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. That's, um, that's where it all started. And it's been a wonderful journey. And you guys have been a huge, everyone in the book club, in other words, has been just a huge part of this for me. And um, thank you for being a part of this journey for me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Thanks you for, for all you do. Thank you for, for literature and authors and, and the people who love books. Oh, thank you. oh, Mary is just popping in. She might want to say hi uh, before you leave. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, sure. Marianne, this, hang on, I'm she's, letting her she's in. coming here from from Kal Kalamazoo, Michigan. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Mary, um, Veronica's about to head out, but we wanted to, to give you a chance to say hi. So hi, everybody. I don't know why my video is not working. Hi, Mary. Hang on a minute. Just the thing hi, Mary. Sorry. There Sorry, I missed everything. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Mary. Hi. Hi, Veronica. I'm so sorry I missed you. Oh, we're celebrating all weekend, raising a glass to ah, Margaret Brown. Yeah, so let's have so. a Margaret Brown weekend. Maybe I can share some recipes in the Oh, I can't wait. Because here, here's a funny <laughs> thing for you, Veronica. You probably did not have anything to do with the movie, of course, from James Cameron. However, in the movie, during the dinner scene, they showed vodka-soaked oranges. Our local paper actually ran the recipe that they used in the movie, and I served it for my friends, and I lost it. But I did not know if you had anything to do with forming any recipes for movies, or if that's something you're looking into. Do you ever do anything like that, or is this particularly for book reasons? I think it would be wonderful to be able to work with the producer of a, a movie or another book about mm -hmm. these core, I call them the core Edwardian cocktails, the Clover Club, the Bronx, the, of course, the Robert Burns. Um, first violinist, Jock Hume was from Dumfries, which is where Robert Burns was from. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many great Titanic tie-ins to the core Edwardian cocktails. Um, so I never have, I, I didn't know about the orange custom, but I'm not surprised because I would think that James Cameron's team probably wanted to spotlight the, um, the discovery of oranges and uh, culinary at that time, which was very new at that point. Um, oranges were a luxury. There's even a story of someone who stuffed oranges in his pockets when he was going to get in a lifeboat. I do remember hearing that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, did you know about the Christmas tradition with the oranges? Very happy with stuffing the cloves in the oranges. No, stuffing oranges into stockings. Oh yes, yeah. That Our family was, does it every year. You you do. We neat. do. Oh, it's a luxury. And all that. One of my ex boyfriends was like, "What do you do and why?" But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they used to be a really coveted treat, and we take yes. them for granted now. It was and very, very rare, and I mean, people had to have them shipped, and to get one on Christmas, especially if you lived out in the Midwest, or you were, you know, East, or whatever, and they just didn't have them. Um, on another note, I don't know if you all realize this, but today was the anniversary of the day the video, for the first time, we saw Titanic's sunken wreck. Oh, today is that day oh. in 86. So I think it's very fitting that we're having a meeting with that time. Oh, so a double meeting and Margaret Brown's birthday. Oh, wow. Wow. We sure nailed it, Joe. Yay. We did. Wait, 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 wait. Didn't they find the ship in September? They did, but they didn't show the video for the public until today. Today was the first launching of the video from the submersibles from Ballard's. What? view but in 96 86 in 86 yes wow it may have been 87 i'll have to that. let me check my phone i just posted it to a couple of the groups 
Okay. Thank but you it so is today. Much. It was on the History Channel. I get the day, wow. you know, this day in history kind of thing. And I found it very interesting that that was today. And it was an anniversary for us. Neat. So let me see if it was cool. 86. I'm pretty sure it was 86. But today was the first day that they showed the video for the first time to the world of what Titanic looked like on the bottom of the ocean. Wow, I, I don't think I knew that, Mary. Oh, That's I very have. cool. I yeah, just I thought that it was really cool that it was today. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm just trying to see where <laughs> I put it in here because I just. And thank you for your beautiful setup there, Veronica. I love seeing your kitchen and. <gasps> Yeah, you did well yes it's so beautiful you could do a little you could you know you could probably make this like a little a thing a, you know a youtube video for people like you know a little cooking channel so little i understand you did some channel. of the i'm sorry go ahead go ahead no no i said i understand you did the cocktails and you did menu correct is that correct veronica today uh you discussed menus from the show a little well. bit yeah we okay. talked a little bit about the crew menu okay oh gino's got a little glass of drink what are you having uh, gino just orange oh. juice. that's it's a beautiful orange glass juice. orange juice that orange was probably juice, though, you know, sure. well that was I probably a, water but hey that was probably a luxury too then if oranges were like yeah yeah it wasn't like we drink orange juice now it comes in all yeah. different kinds of pulp free and low pulp and high pulp and no pulp at all oh, true <laughs> uh, what i also find interesting too is that we still follow some of the traditions and not realize it like how oh. we serve on one side versus the other if we are following etiquette things like that do did you find that etiquette has changed a lot since 1912 Oh yeah. I mean, Mr. Yeah. I mean, obviously we've had some last situation going oh on goodness. here. <laughs> yeah, we've gone from those Titanic eleven course dinners in first class to uh, now, as of this year, the drive through. And um, you know, in between there for about ten years, it's been counter service. So yeah, it's just been a, what a turn of events and. Yeah. I think Mary, Large that's quantities, you know, too. Yeah, and the quantities, <laughs> right? Um, I think that's why people love to study the Titanic so much because it's, mm -hmm. it's just completely different from how we live now. Yes, I used to work at a private club, and they did try to follow some of the same, uh, not necessarily eleven courses, but some of the same etiquette rules and some of the way they set up their tables and things like that. I did find the link I sent. It's July 18th, 1986. All right. We got to see the videotapes for the first time of the, the ship. It was released to the public. Awesome. Well, that's something else to celebrate today. We'll have yes. to, oh, wait, did you just post something on Facebook? Did you post that video? Yes. I think I got a notification that you posted something yep. in the group. Okay. I did. Oh, Veronica, okay. have so you she heard about the that. Grand Hotel? The Grand Hotel? Yes. Mackinac or Mackinac, I always say it wrong. I yeah, Mackinac Island, Michigan. Mackinac. John Jacob okay. Astor's family was responsible for selling a lot of the area with the fur trade. They actually have in the Grand Hotel Astor's, which is their salon, but they filmed the movie Somewhere in Time there which we just watched in a Zoom meeting recently. Oh, but they neat. also do a Titanic weekend where they dress in period dress and have the 11 course meal. Oh, nice. So I did and not know if, you, I didn't know if you were familiar with the Grand Hotel, but it's been there since I think 1870s or 1890s. Now and that you they mentioned do that both hotel, of those weekends. Yeah. yeah, they do both of those weekends, but Park Stevenson was a speaker there. And when they do these, um, Titanic weekends, they do the like a last dinner on Titanic thing. I believe they do like a murder mystery sometimes, so it's not really authentic to what happened on Titanic, but they do try to do a meal. Neat. So I didn't know if you wanted to look into that. Um, if you want to um, get more information, just have Jill get a hold of me and I'll pass on more information. And Veronica, Veronica is also sharing about the uh, Wyoming, the the one in Wyoming, the Ringling Brothers, is that an old house too? It's in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Oh, Baraboo, Wisconsin, where the Ringling sorry. 
and that's the, okay. I would think why I all main because of Helen. Yeah, yeah and uh, right, because Helen, um, it's in Baraboo, which is about 20 minutes northwest of Madison. Mm -hmm. so Madison's a place you can fly into and it's the old um uh A.L. Ringling mansion and wow. it's, the, it's a museum now and the the man who took it over thank goodness he um took it upon himself a, he's a young dad um with a wonderful family and they live upstairs sort of in the third floor level and they worked for the circus for many years on the train and his wife was a motorcycle jumper in the circus. And he has a fabulous collection of Titanic things that a great interest in the Titanic. And in fact, he even had a deck chair that he believed was probably haunted. So he wow. uh, got rid of it. He said that he would come into the room and uh, the deck chair would be in a different place than where he last saw it. Oh my gosh. Uh, he really experienced some strange, some strange behaviors with the deck the chair. Um, apparently it had been found in the ocean with someone clinging to it who did not survive. Oh, so oh, um, wow. he said he had to take the chair and, and he sold Where did he get the chair from? He found it at a, a out west, out east mm -hmm. at, in someone's storage shed. Um, wow. And he uh, offered to purchase it. And um, he, he literally had to get rid of it because he believed it was so, it was affecting his life so much. That's crazy. Yeah. Sorry, don't mean to delve into, you know, that no, whole you're, topic. You're fine. <laughs> no, it's so <laughs> interesting. It's satanic, yeah. and, you know, this is how things his we always we go Joe. kind of go off on chances, Joe. Joe, yeah, we Joe. do that a lot. <laughs> Joe Ringling. Yeah, no, oh. Joe uh, Coloso, C O L O S S O, and I think that's the spelling. And he would be wonderful to talk to the group. He Ooh. he just knows so much about Titanic and, mm. and books, and oh, no. he has a whole um, whole bunch of research he could share. So. Is he the one that puts on the dinner that there, that Titanic dinner? Well, Kim does a lot of those, the work behind oh, that. Oh, right. He's, yeah, he's, as the owner, he's definitely, you know, a huge part of it, and he curates a lot of it. Um, they're just a wonderful family. Have you been to the dinner? I haven't. Um, when I was there, we had a uh, snack buffet, and, um, you know, with heavy appetizers, it was phenomenal, but their, their dinners used to be quite extensive. Because mm. then I heard they weren't, they stopped doing it, but now they're going to start doing it again or something. What I heard was that they had, they had transformed the uh, ballroom into a brewery and they were going to start oh. having uh, steerage parties there. Wow. And that was, I don't have any update on that. So don't know if that's still, if that was still in the works post COVID-19. For um, Eli and for Mary, I wanted to share with you that I made a Clover Club today and I chose the Snapdragon as mm -hmm. a garnish from my garden because um, of Margaret's love of those Asian influences and style in her day. And then also because um, the snapdragon symbolizes graciousness. And mm. when I look at that picture of Margaret with the group she worked on uh, acknowledging Captain Rostron, uh, I don't, I can't think of anyone so brave to be able to be thinking about that at a time when she was surviving something like the Titanic. So the snapdragon symbolizes graciousness and I just thought it was a perfect garnish for um, a Margaret Brown cocktail today so that is very very good that is really sweet she was very inspirational to a lot of people not just women but just her courageousness and then the fact that she worked so hard to get those medals and the loving cup and everything like that out to just not only him but the crew and yes just all I the work she did just to acknowledge them Mm -hmm. spoke for everybody and so yeah. many people would be thinking of themselves sort of linking licking their wounds and 
maybe feeling sorry for yourself or just having trauma to deal with. And she, I'm sure she did have her share of drama, trauma, but um, she didn't let it stop her. Pretty no, I, yeah. I wonder yes. if she really felt like she was speaking for the unspoken, the people yes, that was. couldn't yes, afford did. a trophy or afford, afford to buy a loving cup or something like that to have that symbolized. I wonder if there were other people around but that we don't see in the photo, you know, other survivors perhaps. Yeah. Do we know anything yeah. more about that photo? Well, I know that you, you make a good point um, speaking for the people that couldn't speak. And I, I do think knowing her, knowing about her personality, I'm sure that was forefront on her mind was helping others by taking a stand that she could take because of her position in society. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on that note, uh, um, I know that in one incident, at least one incident, she was helping with the translation uh, with one of the immigrants. I think she was from second class uh, when she had to deal with the Russian uh, consulate in, in the United States. So she went with her and she did all the translation and, and, and she helped her with the talking and, and she got, and whoever that person was, she got the funds that she needed and everything. Wow. I have the, I have the name, I have to check out the name. Well, I didn't realize you. that she knew Russian. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, I found another picture with him and all the officers standing in front okay. of the, in front of. Oh, the, nice. In front of them. I think there's that loving cup in the Titanic Museum in Branson mm -hmm. or Pigeon Forge. One of those. I think they have the. I saw something like that in, in Vegas, so it must be something that either travels or. I'm not sure. Well, I I'm gonna have to leave. It's. Yeah. Um, almost 1.30 here and I've got to head out at 1.30. So um, I'm so glad we got we're, to- We're grateful. Talk Thank you. Good question. Do you do stick autograph stickers for your books? Uh, I can send you a copy with a personalized message. Would you like that? Well, I, yeah, I've, got, I've got the book. I just was wondering if, if you did the, uh, the autograph stickers to go into them for people who had books. Sure. Yeah. If you want, could do you have my um, Facebook connection to p private message me? Yeah, I just I sent you I sent you a friend request, so uh, um, okay. we'll deal with that later. Uh, you okay. need to get out of here. <laughs> oh, oh, Richard, I'm so jealous. Okay. I would love to have the book. Well, send me your addresses, and uh, we'll okay. we'll get you books. And, oh, thank you. Yeah, and. Um, Thank you guys for celebrating with me today. Oh, um, thank you. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for giving us this time and talk. Absolutely. Sorry for my little interruptions. <laughs> um, we're really grateful for you. All right. Well, you guys, I'm grateful for you. This is a great group and let's keep it going. I'm so happy to be a member. Oh, Absolutely. If we can get Kristen on a Zoom, I'll let you know. Maybe come and join us. That would be fun. Oh, um, that would be wonderful. We would get Helen Benzinger to join us too. That would be great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Okay, have a great weekend. You too. Okay. Bye, Veronica. Thank you. Bye. 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 Um, Gino's going to show us a little video. Cool. Of his um, his wreck model. Yes. Is it your wreck model? Or or your, model. Or your Titanic model? Uh, it's actually uh, the wreck model that was. Oh, uh, your wreck. I don't know, but I've even seen your model. It's the wreck model that tours with the Titanic artifact exhibition. If anybody's interested, I had a lot of time to film it. So, you know, and a lot of time to put it together. Um, I've never really shared screen before like this. So, please bear with me if I do it wrong. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, let me just see if I can get it done. So just and Mary, me. I'll send you information. We'll can we can connect after. Oh, thank you, Joe. Welcome. I think that's it. You should be able to see it if it plays. Hmm. Are you guys seeing it? I see a screen. 
shot. We just see a, a little, we just see a little, um, like a icon. film strip thing. Yeah, we see the little icon. Yeah, we see an icon. So you might have to choose which screen to show us. Okay, just hold on. I'm sorry. Yeah, we see your file screenshot right now. Uh, Charlie, I, I'm really, really bad at this. Aren't we all? Yeah, tell me about it. Is it showing now? <gasps> yes, yeah, oh, I see it. Yes. Okay, let's start it from, from the beginning. Now you need to share your audio, Gino, so we can hear your audio. I think it's down by the little there you go. camera. You share um, computer audio. Is it? And then we'll hear it better. Wow. This is a model? Wow. Yeah. I've never seen this before. You've been holding out. <laughs> it's the official one that travels with a Titanic artifact exhibition. It's about two meters long. Wow. That's All right, Richard, what's the uh, equivalent in feet? That's the one we saw in the Vegas uh, tour. Right, but what is it in feet? He says two meters. What is that in feet? Six. A meter uh, is a yard. Okay. So. Wow. Talk about patience and attention to detail. Wow. I actually found the original artist on Facebook and uh, you know he was just bowled over with it. It's like I can't believe it's my model. Yeah. Was that the expansion joint we just saw? Yeah. Yeah. Richard, this is Gino's model. The travels. Uh, that's just awesome. No, Gino, you didn't do this model. This is the one that's in Vegas, right? Yeah, this is the one that's with the artifact exhibit. Oh. Okay, but you did the film. Oh, you did the film. film. Okay. okay. Just want to be clear. Model, yeah. Okay. So it's in Vegas now, or it's just the traveling? No, Wait. I believe it's in storage. You said it travels with what company? Premier Exhibitions. Oh. Yeah, there, there's I, the rep. The rec model, there is a rec model in Vegas with the artifact exhibition that's there, along with the big piece. He said this one travels. This yeah, but the big piece used to travel too, and I don't think they're traveling now. Yeah, but the big piece doesn't travel uh, with the premier uh, exhibition. So. I can't imagine the big piece traveling. Oh my gosh, no. But there is a, a six foot bow rec model um in the uh height in that las vegas tour so i'm wondering if there's more than one bow model there wow this is really amazing how big is this gino about six feet wow so you got to hang out with that model when you were working the exhibition Oh yeah, for eight months. I was in and around this model like you won't believe. You were so lucky. Gino got to work I'm the exhibition, you guys. It. How I'm trying to remember like how many stuff. how many decks is the wreck buried? Is it four or six? If I'm trying to remember, isn't it up to the anchor? Well the bows, yeah, the bow is uh, up to the anchor. 